search for Summer of Scam on New York Magazine's website returns the following results. Wedding planner says she was tricked into marrying a stranger by her company. Sister cafeteria worker is accused of stealing nearly $500,000 in lunch money. Meta scammer arrested for robbing a hacker who tried to scam her. And that's not even including stories about your high-profile scammers like Anna Delvey, Billy McFarland, Elizabeth Holmes, and of course, Joanne, the queen of Caucasian living. As a culture, we are obsessed with tales of double lives, fake identities, and outright fraud. But it's less entertaining if you yourself fall victim to a scammer. That's what happened to journalist Abby Ellen, who almost married a man who turned out to have a complicated relationship with the truth. Her experience inspired her to write a new book, Duped, Double Lives, False Identities, and the Con Man I Almost Married. Abby joins us in the studio today. Welcome, Abby. Hello. So you write in your book, I'd rather be disillusioned than duped, and magicians drive me bananas. They do. <laughs> How they did do. you end up being duped? Tell me your story. Because I was trying to bridge the gap between being a person and being a journalist. You know, journalists are suspicious and they're cynical and they're skeptical and they mistrust and they want to get to the truth. But if you want to be a person in a relationship, then there's some level of trust that you have to display. You have to just, you know, kind of give people the benefit of the doubt, especially the person you are involved with. So I was trying to do that. Um, and the other problem was that nothing he told me was verifiable. So he would tell me that he was going off on a secret mission. He was really a doctor and he w really was in the Navy. But he was told me that he had been a SEAL and he worked with the CIA and he did all these like, you know, super secret things. That and he captured bin Laden. That he captured, he told, that he told his son, because mm. I had broken up him, but yeah, he mm -hmm. told his son that he was responsible for nailing bin Laden. Um, and like all these crazy things, none of which was verifiable. So I tried and I tried and tried to verify stuff and I couldn't. And it was only when I finally could verify something that I was out. And did you feel like because you have this background as a journalist that you really had to shelve this on purpose in order to open yourself up to finding true love? Yes. Yes. I, I would have these conversations with friends and they would say, you know, I would say, I, I, he told me this and he told me that and I don't know if it's true. And my friend said, well, obviously this is the lesson you need to learn, you know, that you can't know the answer to everything. And I thought, I, I, I don't think that's, you know, I don't believe that the universe has a message for me. And if the universe does have a message for me, then its priorities are kind of out of whack. Like there are other people who need the messages from the universe more than I do. So I was really grappling. I was, I was wrestling with myself um, to try and see well, how much I could stand, how, how much I could, how much I could suspend my, my disbelief. So maybe let's take a step back okay. and tell me a little bit about the commander. He's called the commander. In he your is book. called the commander. Uh, tell me how you met. Tell me about how your relationship escalated really quickly. This is how you open the book. Yeah, this is how, okay. I met this guy um, in 2008. I was writing a newspaper article about detox diets. And I needed somebody to tell me whether they had any validity. And so I found this doctor in private practice in Beverly Hills. And he was also a, a, a taught at USC. We talked. He gave me a quote. He was funny. He was great. End of conversation. Story did not run for another year. So I, 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 a year later, I called a fact check. And I said, are you still in Beverly Hills and, and in private practice? He said, no, I left. I'm in, the, I'm in the Navy now. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, I live in Jacksonville, and I re rejoined the Navy where I had been years ago. I got divorced, and my two kids are with their mother in California, and I see them all the time, but I'm in Jacksonville. I said, okay, fine. He said he was opening up a hospital for kids with cancer in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I said, well, that's a story. Keep me posted on that. I was actually leaving New York, at the, or wanted to leave New York, and kind of change up what I was doing. And I was going back to school to go to Johns Hopkins for my master's in international affairs. So it was kind of right in line with what I wanted to do, which was still right, but just kind of change what I was writing about. So every so often, he would keep me posted. And he would tell me these stories. And he would use all this medical jargon, which I didn't understand, and I still don't. But I was happy he kept me, you know, posted. And then the conversation started turning more and more, you know, personal. And by the end of January 2010, he said, um, you know, I'm going to be in New York. Let's get together. And so he said, let's go somewhere celebratory. So in February of 2010, we got together. 
We went to the Four Seasons in New York. He was wearing his navy whites, you know, and, and we hugged hello, and, and the bartender plied us with free drinks. It was like he had just returned from Iwo Jima, you know? I mean, it was lovely. And that was it. And then he told me all sorts of weird things. And if I had any, sh if I had followed my gut, I would have been out of there in five seconds. And the relationship progressed very quickly. He proposed to you. Yep. You moved to D.C. to be I Well, I moved to D.C. I moved to D.C. because I was going to school. Right. So that was part of the whole coincidence. But you, you know? moved in with him. But I moved. Oh, we lived. Where else do you live in Washington if you're going to, if there's going to be deception? We lived in the Watergate, <laughs> which cracks me up. That's I a mean, detail where if I were writing the screenplay, they'd be like, that's a that's, step too it's far. It's too much. That's too that. on the nose. Yeah. I know. We lived in the Watergate. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I, it was, I mean. He just, we got, uh, we got divorced. That's a Freudian slip. We got married, but engaged within five months. But my parents got married after three months, and they're, they've been married 54 years. So that makes, that made sense. I was 42. He was 58. We weren't kids, you know. So it, it all made sense. Except the only thing that didn't make sense is that some of the things he told me, I just couldn't verify, and I, I just didn't believe him. He told me he had met his ex-wife when he rescued her in Iran. In 1990, I said, "What were we doing in Iran in 1990?" He said, "Oh, secret mission. You wouldn't have heard about it." I said, "Okay." He told me that he had been held hostage in China and tortured, and that he escaped. Thank God he had been a long-distance runner in college, and so he could escape. I said, "When were we in China?" He said, "Secret mission. You wouldn't have heard about it." So no, all this stuff, and it didn't make sense to me. But then I thought, somebody has to do these things, right? Isn't that what we learn from? Homeland and Zero Dark Thirty, like there are unknown unknowns. Right, that is a job that, that someone is a job has. That somebody has, and what better decoy? That he wasn't. He didn't look like The Rock. I mean, he was this kind of nerdy little guy. And I thought, well, what better decoy than this nerdy asthmatic little guy? <laughs> right, right. You Nobody's going to suspect him. No one is going to suspect him. And because you doubted some of these bigger things, did you find that sense of doubt or the fact that you didn't trust him fully working its way into smaller elements in your relationship? I have a friend and I mean, I questioned everything. I mean, I, I was questioning my own sanity, you know, so he told me that he had a vault full of medals for operations that didn't officially exist. And I, I didn't know about that. And I would, I would ask teachers of mine at Johns Hopkins who had been former ambassadors and, you know, um, presidential advisors, I would say, can you, is this possible? Can you have an operation, a medal for something that didn't really exist? And they would say, yeah, of course, that's what happens. But I have a friend and her kid had a birthday party and I asked the commander if he would mail the letter for me, the card. And my friend's kid never got the letter. And I must have asked her 82 times, what's going on? Did you get it? Did you get it? And she was like, Abby, you're bugging me, you know, stop. I didn't believe that he had mailed it. And it actually, he had mailed it. I had just forgotten to put on a stamp. So I was questioning everything. He bought me these pearls and I, he, I'm not wearing them. He told me that they were Mikimoto, which is, you know, a very high level brand. And I looked at them and I said, there's no insignia. It doesn't say anything indicating that. And he got mad at me. You know, you don't trust me. You don't trust me. You constantly interrogate me. And he said, I don't know. I just know what they told me. Anyway, I took him to the Mickey Moto store in Manhattan. And they said, these aren't ours. So I was like, ah. It was, it, was, it was gaslighting is the word. Right. And your relationship didn't end because you discovered that he had been deceitful. No. Uh, you only found that out after. The relation, well, the relationship ended in November of, two really in November 2010. So it wasn't even that long. Um, it ended because we went out to dinner with my parents in, in Washington and he, we had this meal and we had Brussels sprouts as part of the meal. And he raved about these Brussels sprouts. They were the greatest food he's ever eaten in his entire life. And I said, okay. And we got outside, my parents left and he said, that was probably the worst meal I've ever had. And I said, why did you lie? And he said, I wanted to make them feel good. I said, they didn't, they didn't cook They it. didn't cook the they Brussels sprouts. They didn't care. Exactly. You, they didn't care. He said, well, that I just wanted to make them feel good. And I thought, if he could lie so convincingly about something so inconsequential, he could lie about anything. And I was like, I'm out of here. So that was pretty much the catalyst. And then finally in December of 2010, I was wearing a wedding ring he gave me. And his son, I overheard his son, who was 12, saying, what's that on Abby's finger? Is that from you? And I thought, that's really weird because he had told his son 
that we were getting married, or at least he said he had told the son that we were getting married, and the son was expecting that, and why would he be asking about the ring? And I told this to the commander. He said, well, well, he forgot, you know? And I said, kids don't forget that their parent is getting remarried. Right. And that's when I was done. And then later. So I was done. A year and a half, I was done, and I thought to myself, did I just blow the best thing that ever happened to me? And you talk about this period of self-doubt, too. Yeah, absolutely, because I thought, wow, you know, I'm just so mistrustful, I'm so cynical, I'm awful. God, I just should have been able to not have to question everything he did. Well, in March 2012, I picked up the phone, 202 area code, that's Washington, and it was somebody uh, from NCIS, which is the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. There is a doctor who's writing prescriptions for narcotics, for Vicodin and other drugs. Uh, your name is one of them that he's been using. Do you know this guy and do you have a prescription? And I said, I know this guy, but no, I like Valium. <laughs> it's not my, I don't like Vicodin. <laughs> it's not mine. That's his first mistake. Yeah, that was his first mistake. <laughs> anyway, it turns out he'd been using all stealing identities of my, my name, people he worked with at the Pentagon because he really did work at the Pentagon, his dead mother, his ex-father-in-law, I mean, all these people. He went to jail. And I was elated because I was like, yes, I was right. I was right. Vindication. I felt, I, yeah, I felt like Carrie in Homeland when she finds out that Brody is really a jihadist. I was is that right. a spoiler? I don't know. It's okay. okay. <laughs> it's fine. It's okay. I was, I was right. And... Um, that's when I kinked it to journalist mode. And I called people he worked with, I called his ex-wife, I called his ex-ex-wife, I didn't know she existed. I called the woman he was engaged to while he was engaged to me. She, he was living with her in Jacksonville, Florida. And in February of 2010, he walked out the door. He said to her, I'm going on a secret mission. I'll call you when I come back. He never came back and the operation, the secret mission was Operation Abbey. So she and I became friends. I, I just, I called all these people and then I began piecing it together. And then you talk about the summer of scams. I, I, I you know, I, I, it occurred to me that this was happening all the time. This was all we were hearing about. This is, I had written a story about this for Psychology Today and I got tons of responses from people, mostly women, but not all, who'd been duped. And I thought, you know, we don't talk about this. We talk about the perps. We want to know how they do it. We want to know what they're thinking. We don't care about the victims. The victims are stupid. They're idiots. They're gullible. We need to talk about the victims. We need to talk about how this happens and, and how it doesn't matter. You know, it happens to smart people. It doesn't, you don't, it's not the only dumb people this happens to. It happens to everybody. Absolutely. And there was an article in The Cut that came out last week where a woman talked about being taken for an enormous sum of money yeah. by a man that she was in love with who ended up being a Nigerian scammer. Mm -hmm. um, and she writes about how people don't talk about it because there is shame. There's embarrassment. Um, but you write about how you actually didn't feel that shame or embarrassment, yeah. that you were telling everybody about this story. I am a I'm a writer. So to me, it was a story. So I was like, guess what happened? And um, I didn't realize that that was probably something I wasn't supposed to do. I, I had a job interview with these people who were maybe going to have, have me ghostwrite their book. And um, they said, what are you writing on? And I told them that I was working on my own project about this guy I went, was involved with who went to jail and the whole thing. And the agent who had set up uh, us up said, I don't think you should have told them that. It doesn't look good on, for you. It doesn't reflect well on you. And I just thought, really? So I told my taxi driver, I told everybody. I just, it was a story to me. And I'm glad I did because that's how I got so many stories that are in my book, duped. It was, every time I mentioned it to somebody, somebody knew somebody who it had happened to or it had happened to themselves. And I think that it is important for people who are obviously intelligent, high profile, worldly to come forward and say, it happened to me, it can happen to anyone. It can happen to, I mean, whether it's work, whether it's romance, you know, whether it's your sibling, whether you find out later in life that your father had a whole family around the corner. Charles Lindbergh, you know, Charles Lindbergh, airplane guy. He had three families. He had one here in the United States with Anne Mara Lindbergh, and then he had three others in Germany. I mean, don't trust a Nazi. There's that. Don't trust a Nazi. And there's, you know, maybe, I mean, maybe he picked up aviation for a reason. Right. <laughs> you know, right. So he can make the round. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so you open with your own personal tale, but then you go into sort of like the psychology of con artists. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
I'm curious about, you mentioned this incident with the Brussels sprouts, right? About yeah. if you can lie about something small, yeah. you can lie about something huge. Yeah. But that's not necessarily true. You talk about how we all lie every day. We do. And you yourself kept a lie journal I did. for six months as an exercise. Tell I me did. a little bit about that. But you know, when I told you I liked your dress, I was not lying. I really like your Thank dress. Thank you. So I, wasn't, I, was, I wasn't questioning yeah. that, but now I... <laughs> now you know. I, I feel love really that solid dress. about that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to see what I lied about. And what I realized is, because everybody lies, and if they say they don't, they're lying. Um, we lie, you know, there are white lies, and I'm okay with the white lies. Like, I want somebody to tell me I look okay, especially if I'm out in the world. You don't need to tell me I look awful if I can't go home and, and you know, put a bag over my head. Just, just I'm fine with that. But I, I lied about, let's see, I lied about, um, I told a friend that I didn't have any cheese sticks in the refrigerator. I did. I just didn't feel like sharing them. I told my spinning teacher, she asked, you know, what, what, what mileage we got, and we were supposed to get 15, and I think uh, I told her I had gotten 12, and instead I had really gotten 10. I mean, I totally, I, I don't know why. Maybe I was embarrassed because there were other people around. Um, you know, the one that everybody tells is, oh, I'm five minutes away, when they're not, you know, they're 15 minutes right, away. Right, I'm still I mean, at home, I'm still, actually. when they're still at home, yeah. actually. Right, still in the shower. I mean, these are the kind of things, and I did that, too. Um, so how does someone go from being a fibber to being a total imposter? Yeah, it's a really good question. There is something to be said. There, There is some thought that it's a brain issue. And what's interesting about pathological lying is that it is not a diagnosis unto itself. So it's a subset of other things. On, and we say, are they psych psych psychopaths? Are they sociopaths? What are they? Are they narcissists? Every psychopath is a liar, but not every liar is a psychopath, right? Mm -hmm. So. These people, sometimes they have different brains. I mean, there's, there's been studies that have shown that pathological liars have different brains, but here's something else. The more you tell a lie, when you tell, first tell a lie, this part of your brain um, lights up. And the more you tell it, the less it lights up. So eventually you become, you begin to believe your own lies. It's like a muscle. It's like a muscle. Mm -hmm. It's like it's like playing an instrument. It's like playing the cello. You just know where to go, right? Without a fret, you right. just know where to go. So that's exactly it. So eventually, you begin to be, to believe your lies. So I'm curious about if we had the commander on, mm -hmm. he would charm you. What would his story be? Like it's all true. He mm -hmm. would. I did. He would say it is all true. I here's a story. Okay, we. I leave the Watergate and or I say, listen, uh, we, I left him. And I said, I'm going to stay in the Watergate because I didn't have anywhere to go. My place here was rented. I said, I'm going to go and, and, and stay in the living room. You can have the bedroom, and I'll just find a place, and you know, we'll figure it out. He said, no, I'll stay in my brother's in Georgetown. You stay here. I said, okay. Two weeks later, he says to me, the Navy needs the apartment, so we both have to move everything out. He said, I'll ship your stuff back to New York. I said, fine. So I ended up commuting once a week from New York City. I found a place here, and I commuted to Washington. In the meantime... I drive by the Watergate one night, and the lights are on. And, you know, I can't help myself. I'm Nancy Drew. So I call him up, and I said, are you back in the Watergate? Or is that a tenant? Is that someone from the Navy? He said it was a comedy of errors. The Navy needed the apartment back. I moved everything out and put it in storage, and then they said, nope, come on back. So I had to move everything back in. And I said, well. So crazy. I said, well, I, I need to come and pick up my cookbooks. And, and my rugs that I left there. So I'm gonna come and get them, which is not true. I don't even like to cook. But anyway, I wanted to see what was going on. So I lied. And so I went to the apartment, and everything was exactly as it was when I had left it, down to a sliver of soap in the soap dish. And I looked at him, and I said, you never left. And he looked me straight in the eye, and he said, oh, yes, I did. And that's when I thought, he's nuts. And nothing, nothing, nothing I could say to him would make him waver. This is my story, and I'm sticking to it. So you asked me what he would say if, if you went up to him and said what was going on. He would say, everything is true. He, he told that to his son. He said, all will be revealed in due time. Feel so bad for his kids. Oh, his kids. I mean, it's his kids who were the most traumatized. Yeah, his I'm son sure. worshipped his father mm -hmm. and wanted to be like him and would have had his father wear his you know, his uniform everywhere they went. And then he had to find out the mother had to go and say, yeah, dad's been lying all this time. Yeah. You talked a little bit about psychopaths and sociopaths. And a hallmark of the psychopath is that they don't have empathy for other people. Correct. But you also write about how in order to be a really good con artist, you have to deeply understand other people yes. and be able to put yourself 
in their shoes so that you know how to position your story. They're it's, really smart. It seems like a little bit of a conflict. They're really smart. They're they're the most, if you look at Frank Abagnale, or here's a better guy. Frank Abagnale is from Catch Me If You Can. So, you know, that's Leo. Everybody knows who that is. But there was another guy named Waldo DeMora, and he was, they made a film about him called The Great Imposter. He passed himself off as a doctor, as a surgeon, as a social worker, as a monk. He was doing all these things, and he was so smart. Like, he was a good s uh, surgeon. Yeah, he was literally saving lives in Korea. He was saving Korea. lives in Korea. <laughs> right. Exactly, exactly. Wow, you actually read the book. Yeah, yeah wow. I read the book. Yeah. <laughs> or you're lying, but I don't think you are. He, he was a really good surgeon, and people had a hard time believing that he wasn't who he said he was. He was brilliant. And when somebody said, why did you do this? Why are you telling lies? He said, pure rascality. I'm just a rascal. I just wanted to move the chess pieces. I just wanted to see what I could get away with, you know? I mean, like you also that. write about the famous study where they have um, toddlers in a room mm -hmm. with a toy under a blanket, and the social psychologist says, don't look at the toy, and of course the kids inevitably do. And the ones who lie about it when asked about it have higher IQs than they, the ones who tell the truth. Beyond that, they, they have higher IQs, but also the most popular kids in school are usually liars. The kids who, because they know how to, they tell stories, they know how to make people feel good. You know, people, the most popular kids are not the most honest, and there's a correlation there. And we can see that every day in our own lives. We see that with people in office, in weather, and I'm not even gonna, it, the, the right lies and the left lies, uh, everybody lies, in, you know, politically, I think. Um, Especially journalists, right? <laughs> it's all fake, so. It's, it's fake news, right. you know that. <laughs> this interview is not even happening. Um, but we see that with CEOs, we see that, you know, it's just sort of part of the job. It's made me so cynical. Mm -hmm. I believe absolutely nothing that I hear, and also, if somebody tells me a story about some terrible thing that happens, I doesn't even phase me. And you write about how one of the biggest casualties of being conned is that you start to distrust other people, but more importantly, that you start to distrust yourself. You distrust yourself. I, I didn't, and that's what I was saying. I was gaslit. I didn't know, did, did, I, did I mail that letter? Did he mail that letter? It was like, I don't know which way is up, and I couldn't trust my own judgment. How do you refine your own well, moral I'll tell barometer? You how. I'll tell you how. Because I actually have a damn good radar. That's how. I left this guy after a year. I said, something's off and I'm out of here. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew enough to get out. Um, years later, I met another guy. And I write about it. And he told me he was separated from his wife. You know, And they were really separated the way you and I are separated by you know, a book. I mean, they weren't separated at all. And I left. I said, you're nuts. I'm out of here. You're lying to me. I'm, he wasn't nuts. He was just a liar. I'm out of here. So, and I knew something was off. So actually I learned that I have a really good gut. Um, and I think most people tend to have good guts, they just don't follow them. Mm. And that's the, th you know, and this is my big takeaway, or one of them, and it sounds so basic and so trite, but if you think something feels off, it's off. We've talked a little bit about the psychology of the con artist, yeah. but I want to touch briefly on the psychology of people who are perhaps most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, Dirty John, I don't know if you listened or watched Dirty John. I know Dirty it. Don. I've watched it. I've seen her. She's become a friend. Yeah. 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 I, you know, Debbie, on the podcast, you know, she talks about, or they talk about her particular vulnerabilities and about how um, she was just looking for a guy who would be nice to her and wash her hard. car for her. I mean, the, the bar is so low. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the psychology of people who are perhaps most vulnerable to the, con artists. They're, they're, you know, it's, I, it's funny. I, 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 we're all vulnerable, but if you catch someone at different stages of their life when they've just gone through something traumatic, let's say, they're more vulnerable. But also, the more invulnerable you think you are, the more vulnerable you are. So I met a woman who is a doctor, and she had a friend who was lying for years about having a terminal illness. It never occurred to her that he would be lying because she's a doctor. She would know. She was totally vulnerable, and she said, he targeted me. She said he knew exactly what he was doing when he became my friend because I was a great cover. So it's the people who are, look, I was 42 when I met this guy. I had never really wanted to be married. I didn't care about that. But I thought, all right, I'm 42 years old. Like, maybe it's time. You know, maybe I should start thinking about becoming like a real person. And so at that time, I was, uh, he was good. He was decent. He was kind. He was funny. He was smart. He was charming. And he adored me. 
So does that make me vulnerable or does that make me say I want to be with somebody who's nice? Well, if you've been in New York City or anywhere, but you've dated for many years, you're just happy to have somebody who's actually like going to show up when they say they'll show up and maybe call you when they say they're going to call. You know, people and it's very easy to flake out. Right. Very easy. And social media has made it even easier. So when you like Deborah Newell, she just wanted somebody who was kind of nice and a good guy and, you know, wasn't an axe murderer. Yeah. That that was pretty much you know that's that's pretty much it. Is that a, ha a mark of vulnerability? Unfortunately, maybe these days it is. And maybe I'll close out with a question about okay. social media. Okay. Um, we all portray a better version of ourselves oh, yeah. online. We all white lie about how great our lives are. Um, can we just can we blame the internet for the rise in scam artists? Yeah, you know I do. I blame social media, but here's the thing. I think the internet is also why we keep hearing about them, because it's so easy to get caught. So it's very easy to fabricate. It's, I mean, we're fabricating every time I post, you know, about my, my artisanal breakfast that I have, right? And I post a picture of it on Instagram, which is a joke, because I don't cook. So, I mean, when you're doing that, the whole world thinks that you have this fabulous life. You're creating a fiction. And it's the same sort of thing with, eventually you'll get caught doing that. That's what happened when Ashley Madison, that breach. Right. All these people were detected. They were found out. So I think social media is, that's why we keep hearing these stories. It's easier to do the scams. It's easier to get caught. And we're just going to keep seeing more and more and more and more of them. Abby Ellen, your book is called Duped, and it is currently available wherever books Everywhere are sold. Everywhere you go. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming on the thank show. Thank you.